And I think the biggest thing is just having those open conversations with your friends, having those open conversations with your loved ones, having those open conversations starting at home. I know, you know, even my boyfriend and I, we are, we like to have those talks. We like to have those discussions. We like to just kind of stay in tune and, and, and not be afraid to voice our opinion. Hi, everybody. It's Linda Laurel. Welcome to a new episode of Our Voices Matter podcast. This is the first episode that I have taped since the inauguration. And I think we might agree that um, one of the standouts of that day, aside from our new president and vice president, is young Amanda Gorman, the poet laureate who just blew us all away with her beautiful poem to end the inaugural ceremony. Um, No, she's not my guest, although I wish she were. I'm trying to get her, so stay tuned for that. But my guest today is a, a a young woman of the same generation who is equally impressive in her own right. At the age of 25, she is now a published author. She is a musician. She is an actor. She is a model and a social media influencer with mm, about three and a half million followers across multiple platforms. Um, I would call her a modern day Renaissance woman. And at 25, she is just getting started. She also happens to be the significant other of a very well-known and well-loved NFL quarterback. If you wanna find out more about this amazing young woman, all you have to do is listen or watch this week's episode. Enjoy. Julie, it is such a pleasure to have you on our Voices Matter podcast. Thank you so much for agreeing to share some time with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So I, you know, have learned so much about you since um, uh, knowing that we were going to have this time together. And so you are a huge social media influencer and a model and an author and a fitness expert. And I mean, just all of these amazing things. Um, what what drives you at this moment, especially given all the craziness that's happening in the world right now? Absolutely. I think the number one answer for me is just my family. Each and every day, you know, they're the ones who keep me going, especially my parents. They're so supportive in every endeavor, in every decision I make, in every opportunity that comes my way. They're just, you know, full throttle. They're so supportive in everything I do. So I definitely think my parents, you know, um, me being an inspiration and motivation to my little brother and just to show him that, you know, anything is possible, especially him, just my family. They're the ones who keep me going each and every day. Yeah, I hear you. And I and I know that you also are um, a self-described um, uh, social butterfly. So you uh, enjoy. So I've done my research, right? I've checked out, of course, your Instagram and your YouTube. I and, love it. I love it. Oh, my God. OK, so you have like three and a half million followers across multiple platforms. Yes. And what's your primary message that you want people to know? What are, what are your followers looking to you for? I just think the most important thing is just not being afraid to be yourself. I think so many people ask me, you know, how did I get to where I'm being? And the thing is, I was myself. I was never trying to be anybody else. You know, there will never be another Jilly. And I think that's my biggest message to people when they see their their my, all my content. I just want them to know that anything is possible. Be you, be you. Because guess what? The best power that you have is being yourself because there's no one else like you. That is the absolute truth. So let's talk about all of the different things that you are. So most recently, you are a now published cookbook author. Yes, I love it. This Boss Babe Can Cookbook. What a great name. I love it. Thank you. I totally love it. And I can't wait to get a copy, but it's already sold out. I've sold out five times. Can you believe it? Five, literally five different times. (laughs) Unbelievable, unbelievable. Okay, so uh, tell us about the inspiration for the cookbook. Absolutely. So it's so crazy because this whole project, this whole endeavor definitely came through during quarantine, actually. So um, as you already know, as you said it, I moved to L.A., um, you know, with music, with acting. Those were my first primary focus and that's all I did and so with music acting and modeling um on the forefront obviously during quarantine you know being 
at home was the number one thing that everyone had to do in the world. So I had a lot of time on my hands and I was cooking a lot, like a lot, a lot. And just having fun in the kitchen, making up so many different recipes. I'm talking about like booty and stuff, chicken, just just crazy different recipes. And it was actually my boyfriend who was the one who was telling me, are you writing these recipes down? I kid you not just randomly. He was like, have you been writing these recipes down? And I'm like, no, I'm just making stuff up. I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know if I can repeat what I'm doing. And a couple months went by and I'm still in the kitchen, just making up some stuff. And he asked me again, the question came back up. Are you writing these recipes down? And I'm just like, no. And I thought about it that night and I was just like, you know what? You kind of might be onto something. So I kind of thought about it. I pondered on it. And then I was just like, why not? There's no better time than now. I'm not doing much. You had, you had the time. Certainly. I had the time. <laughs> and I mean, if any time to do it, now is the perfect time or well, now as right. in then. So it was about, I want to say when the, the question first came, it was about March of 2020. And then around May, June, I was like, you know what? Let me really take a pen and paper. So I just started jotting all these recipes down, jotting them down. After I would cook, I would sit down and write them down. And then before I knew it, I actually presented it to my mother. And I was like, I showed her everything and I had enough recipes. I was like, I have enough recipes to make, you know, at least a first edition of a cookbook. And And now here, and now here we are and you're sold out, you're sold out five times. Now, since you brought it up, you mentioned your boyfriend. Now, folks who are watching this, some of them will already know this, but for those of you who don't know, Jilly's boyfriend is none other than Houston Texans quarterback, Deshaun Watson. Yes, ma'am. And he is beloved as much as you are beloved as well. And uh, you guys have been together now for, I think you just celebrated your, your, your first year anniversary. And well, now it's been a year and a half. So a year and a half. We're almost to the two year mark. Yes, Oh my ma'am. goodness. Wow. I know lies, but yes, ma'am, almost two years. And and so he was the one who kind of nudged you to just go ahead and do it. I mean, you might Absolutely. as well, right? It was so crazy because now we we officially both became published authors at the age of 24. So his book came out, I think a month or a month and a half or two months before mine. So we were literally like back to back. So it was like, what's up? We, we both right here together. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That is really fantastic. So how have you guys navigated um, this, this quarantine, um, not only COVID, but also all the, the social justice uh, unrest, all the things that have happened in the last year. And so much of it, um, you know, was really hit, home close to those of us here in Houston, and you're originally, of course, from Houston, um, with the George Floyd connection and, you know, his murder and all of that. So how have you guys talked about all of that and kind of navigated through that part of this, this pandemic time that we're living in? Well, first and foremost, it was so amazing to actually be a part of the uh, social justice, just the march. We actually walked with the family front row. We were with his family um, during the march here in Houston. So that just gives me chills to talk about just because, you know, so many people around the world, even in different countries, were marching. And so just to be a part of these, you know, historical moments, especially that are going to be in history books. It was such a beautiful, beautiful moment because I haven't done um, marches before. I've, of course, spoken about it. I know that my platform is big enough where, you know, my fans and my younger fans and supporters definitely look up to what I say. So I have spoken out on many of the things that I feel, you know, are necessary and so close to my heart. But to be on the front line and then march and then be with his family was just something that I don't know. It was just it was it was an overwhelming feeling. It was just what what did you take? What did you take away from that experience? I think the unity of it all. I think the fact that we could all come together, black, white, Hispanic, Latino, um, Chinese, Asian, just everything, women, men, um, just everything. It was, it was no limitation. It was no cap. It was no, no, just no bias on, you know, us all joining together and being one, actually being one, actually having, no matter what the differences are, it was that one like-mindedness of everyone. Because at the end of the day, we're all marching in a fight towards justice, which means that was one thing that we all have in common. At the end of the day, you know, this world divides us so much, so much, you know, dividing on just not the same like-mindedness or anything, but the fact that we could all come together under one circumstance, to me, that spoke so highly. So definitely the unity of it all. 
Yeah. You know, so many people are really looking to your generation to once and for all help our society get past the racial divides that have plagued us since the beginning of this country. Absolutely. And when, you know, I hear someone like you with the platform that you have, and clearly you're very, um, you know, educated and articulate and passionate and aware of what is going on. Um, And then you also bring um, a a perspective of being, um, well, why don't you share with with our audience what your, your racial and ethnic identity is because you're a mixture of many different things which I think is reflective of kind of where we are as a society. So why don't you share that with us? Absolutely. I'm African-American, um, Creole, and my, so my dad's side and my mom's side actually is all from Louisiana. Um, so my mom's whole side, mom and dad, her parents, excuse me, her mom and dad are from Louisiana. My dad's mom's side is from Louisiana as well, but his dad's dad's side is from the Netherlands. So I'm Dutch, Creole, and African-American. Wow. So you've got some of everything in you. No, literally. And that's not, I don't even know, honestly, all of it, but I do know it's so crazy because I found out the Netherlands part quite young, but not as young as I knew about African-American and Creole. So when I found out like the Dutch part, it was so crazy because my dad, um, my dad met his brothers kind of late. It was like, you know, kind of separate two different lives. And so when he finally met his blood brothers, it was so crazy because number one, they look just like him. And number two, they don't speak a lick of English. They don't speak any English. So it's just so amazing to know that those are my real uncles, my blood uncles. So it's actually really amazing. It's amazing. Wow. And that just shows you, you know, that that we all have some of, um, you know, different ethnicities. I mean, you know, um, different racial makeup. And and the bottom line is that, you know, we're we're all human. So as you as you grew up in Houston, which is a very diverse city, but that isn't to say that there isn't racism in this city because there is there's it's everywhere. So as a as a mixed race child, did you have any any sort of. um uh, instances that that stand out in your mind that help kind of shape your perspective of the world? Absolutely, absolutely. I remember it's so such a vivid memory. When I was in um, sixth grade, actually, I had a Hispanic girl who was very, very like, it was so crazy because I don't think at the young age, I knew it was exactly racism, but I knew it was not nice. And um, she told me before she was like, oh, you have cat eyes. And at the end of the day, I'm in sixth grade. I don't want to be related to a cat. You know, that's just rude. It's just not nice. So, I mean, I won't say what I said back, but (laughs) no, I definitely, I, I, you know, I probably just said that like she was fat, which is what I did say, but it was so interesting because I do want to, I wouldn't say that, but I do want to tell you why I said that because when we got called to the principal's office, this was such an interesting moment. The principal had called my mom, told her what was going on. So my mom came and they told my mom that I called the girl fat. And my mom was like, well, why is it okay? I mean, excuse me, why is my daughter the one getting in trouble for calling her fat when she was the first one who said something towards my daughter and then said she had cat eyes? Well, you know, the principal was like, that's a compliment saying your daughter has cat eyes no calling my daughter in in relation to a cat that in sixth grade that is not you're not meaning that in a sense of you know being funny and so you know Mm -hmm. it was so crazy because that was another sense of just starting early racism how the principal was just taking this girl's side and it was so crazy my mom wasn't having it and that was a really really pinnacle moment for me just to see how my mom fought for that and then of course I never got in trouble because at the end of the day my mom made such such relatable and and factual facts it's not okay for my daughter to get called this name and for her not my daughter not to defend herself because that's all I did was defend myself but at in sixth grade I don't want to be called cat eyes just because I have colored eyes that wasn't a compliment it wasn't. Wow. It's so interesting. Sixth grade. So that brings to mind my sixth grade experience and the first time that I was called the N word mm. by a classmate. And like you, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I knew that it was derogatory. Mm-hmm. I knew that it was directed at me because of the color of my skin. I didn't really, you know, at 11 years old, understand all of the ramifications, but it angered me. And I'll tell you know what my response was? What? I'm not proud of it, but I slapped her. See? Okay, so now I feel better about saying that. Okay, okay, okay. I did. I did. I slapped her. And um, 
I don't remember. Uh, I actually, I don't think there was a teacher in the room, so I don't think there was any sort of repercussions from the authorities in the in the in the school. But the end of the story is that we ended up becoming really good friends. Really? Yes, we ended up becoming really good friends, and uh, and I I'm not even sure how that happened, but. It's, you know, the thing is when, you know, when you grow up in a household, and so I was having this conversation with a, with someone the other day, and I was ex- sharing this incident, and I said, you know, she probably didn't even really know what she was saying and what it meant. She probably grew up in a household where it was okay to say the N-word against people with brown and black skin. Mm. And, you know, so, you you know, if you're taught and that's all you know, then that's what you do. And that's why the the ignorance factor is such a big one when it comes to this whole conversation about race. Absolutely. Um, because, you know, if you don't know someone and know that, you know, I, regardless of how you look, you're basically just like me in terms of being a part of the human race and wanting the same basic things that we all want from life. Absolutely. And if we can get past all of that. So I think your generation is uniquely positioned to help us have these conversations and get and get past it. I mean, what are you guys, people, I say you guys, people your age talking about right now when you look at kind of where the country is and where your generation uh, wants to take it in the future? I just think it's so many limitless possibilities, especially starting, you know, with we have the first woman african-american woman at that vice president and that alone and is south horrible. asian woman and the first and south, south asian, asian woman, woman. Like, yeah that, it's unheard of it's it's i know it's crazy know. because we will no longer be able to say that this isn't a, a possibility you know yeah. uh, even kids younger than me now can look up to where it's like this is all they know now And I think that is just something that is so, so beautiful. And I think to answer your question, I think the biggest thing is just having those open conversations with your friends, having those open conversations with your loved ones, having those open conversations starting at home. I know, you know, even my boyfriend and I, we are, we like to have those talks. We like to have those discussions. We like to just kind of stay in tune and, and, and not be afraid to voice our opinions. And I think it starts at home. I think having those open discussions and, and being aware of it and, you know, not shy away from those topics is just so important because we are living in in a, a such a, a historical moment in so many different ways not only the ways that you described a few minutes ago but just right now just going forward how we have a president who has to really reverse pretty much everything you know and within what happened in the last four years so just being open about it just having those friends where you're talking about more than clothes you're talking about more than getting your hair and nails done you're talking about more than just what happen on Instagram. So just mm-hmm. having those diverse conversations that kind of keep you in tune, kind of keep your mind sharp, just keep you aware of what's going on. And especially with my generation, it's so important for, you know, moments like this that are happened a couple of days ago where we have a new president and a new vice president to speak about it, to tell people, you know, this is the, the very last time we'll be able to say there has never been a woman vice president ever. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. think, you know, like saying that and, and and letting people know who aren't really as in tune with um, politics and everything. I think just, you know, always being vocal and not being afraid to be vocal. You know, there's a time and a place for it because it's a very touchy subject for a lot of people, but just not being afraid to be vocal because my one post about the inauguration day, you don't know how many people that touched or how many people probably haven't seen anything. You know, there, a lot of people. What lit. did you What did you post? What did you post about the inauguration? I posted how this will be the last time that we have never had a woman vice president in office. And I just to me, that was the most powerful thing. It was just a, a great day for America. So for and me, did you fun. did you get all positive responses? Oh, I got or did you... So many. Of course, there's those there, negative. There's always some trolls out there. Absolutely. Right? And it's so yeah. funny because the thing with trolls is it's always a, a random fake page that follows like 200 people, but has no followers and has no Mm -hmm. profile picture. So of Mm -hmm. course you get those random trolls, but the the feedback that I got from it was so, so beautiful, so powerful. And to my surprise, so many men responded too, just, you know, just with encouragement and just 
just loving to see women empowerment. I mean, women are mm-hmm. going right now. Women are we are rocking it right now. We are, we are rocking it. Aren't we are we? Rocking okay. it. Okay. It's our turn. turn. <laughs> it is our, our turn. turn. It yeah. is our turn. So I was really happy to hear you say that you and Deshaun talk about this kind of thing, you know, Absolutely. and and he, of course, being in such a prominent position as a quarterback, mm-hmm. um, you know, for uh, an NFL team. Um, and so much of the controversy that started with, you know, when uh, Kaepernick took a knee Absolutely. and, you know, all of the different conversations that have been reported in the media over the last few years since then, where players are now having more um, open and honest conversations yes. where, you know, the white players might not understand what it's like for the black players you know, at the end of the day, you know, Houstonians, you know, we, we know Deshaun and we know him in his uniform, et cetera. But the reality is that when he's out and he's not readily identifiable as a Houston Texan, mm-hmm. he's just another black man in America. Absolutely. You and, have- and that has to concern him and you. Absolutely. You know, it concerns just how it is with my, my father, my brother. I have a black father. I have a black brother. I have a black boyfriend, you know, black mother, a black grandmother. I am a black woman myself. And so at the end of the day, of course, that's another concerning thing. That's why I think it's so beautiful. You know, you pick and choose when the time is right, but especially even for him to just be more vocal about it this year and and let people know, you know, I'm more than a quarterback. I'm a black man. And I just think it's such a, it's a, that's a powerful statement alone. You know, you're bringing so much just awareness to it because I don't know. I just don't think people get it. Mm -hmm. Some people just don't understand what it's like being a a black person in society. You know, no matter, no matter the thing. to survive day to day and and all of the different things that go along with that. Yeah. No matter the fame, no matter the money you, at the end of the day, it's, I'm a a black person. When I get pulled over, you know, there's a lot of people in this world who will never understand the, the scaredness, the, the adrenaline, Mm -hmm. the, the just the chills I get that run through my body of, okay, let me just call my mom real quick before they even walk up to my window, just put the phone down on the passenger seat. People don't understand that. I mm-hmm. do that every single time. Oh, I don't get pulled over that much. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm glad you clarified that. Right. I'm like every time, every Monday. <laughs> no, but um, whenever I do get pulled over those like few times, I definitely, I call my mom super quick. I call my mom or my dad and I just like throw the phone down. My mom, there's a cop behind me. She's like, just keep me on speaker. Just put me down. I'll just sit here, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the scariest feeling it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the other thing that I, I, I love about what you've shared about Deshaun is that he um, supports you and he's the one who pushed you to do the cookbook. And I love that you have embraced your your Creole roots. So yes. uh, what's what's your favorite recipe in the cookbook? Oh, you know, I love that you asked that. OK, so I have a few. I definitely have a few. But OK, I, this one right here. This is called um, Grouchy Gammy's Gumbo. And Ooh. this is my grandmother's recipe. So by the way, I didn't tell you, it is a cookbook slash lookbook. So for every single recipe, I have a different look. Like literally it's just pictures on pictures. Because you are a fashionista after oh, all. Fashion is my middle <laughs> name. But um, this one for sure has to be my favorite. And I think why it's so special to me is because whenever I was doing this cookbook, I knew I wanted to do a few um, generational recipes. And with this one, I was asking my gimme, hey, can you, you know, email me the recipe for the gumbo? Long story short, you know, she's old school. She doesn't do email. She'll barely send it in text. So she was like, how about I'm going to write it to you. I'm going to bring it to your parents' house and then go from there. So whenever she wrote it, first and foremost, she has like the most beautiful, you know, cursive old school handwriting. Oh, I and I was it. thinking, I was like, I can't type this and just put it in. It won't give it that same effect. So I literally took a picture of it and scanned it and had it put in here. And I just thought it was so beautiful because now my Gammy's legacy will forever be in my book. Will forever. Yes. So what a beautiful coffee table cookbook, fashion book. I mean, a little bit of everything, right? I love that. Everything. I kid you not. It has so many, just so many different looks. I'm, I had looks on looks on looks. And I think um, one of the one of her recipes happens to be my favorite just because it was also a recipe that we've had in our house for over I'm 25 now for over 25 years. My gimme makes it every Thanksgiving Eve and Christmas Eve. And so finally for me to put the recipe out, people just lost it. They were like, you actually gave us the gumbo recipe. I was like, I know, maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> 
Oh my goodness. I, I, I can't wait to get the book because my husband loves gumbo and I can't wait to, to show him your Gammy's gumbo yes. recipe. I can't wait for you to cook it. And once you do, you have to send me a picture. Oh, I will for sure. I absolutely will. I just, I just love it. Oh my gosh. There's so much that I, I, I want to talk to you about. Um, so, so you have this cookbook, but then you also, um, obviously I'm sure you love to eat, but you're in great shape. And so that means fitness is, is a big part of what you do. And I know you've done some fitness modeling. So what kind of fitness routine do you, uh, do you do or use to keep yourself in shape? So my least like motivated days, well, my Peloton, that is my girl. My Peloton and I <laughs> have an, an incredible relationship, especially on those days where I don't want to do too much. There's days that I don't want to go crazy in the gym or spend an hour and a half, two hours working out. So my Peloton is definitely like my go-to, get my 30, 45 minute cardio in and I feel great. But um, I think just the main thing is just consistency. I even though I love my comfort food, I love, you know, eating, I am a foodie. At the same time, my look, I love feeling good. I love looking good. And that just comes with, you know, being passionate and being consistent about working out. For me, like I said, sometimes I don't go crazy hard. I think that's the misconception too. I think people think every single day I'm like 80,000 squats and 80,000 sit-ups and everything. It's just like, no, it's consistency. Even when I'm eating food, it's all about portion control. And I think that's another thing that people like fail to realize. I'll have all this great food. And especially since I do cook a lot, I'll have, you know, all this food here, but I'm not eating 12 plates. I'm not eating a big old plate that I make for my boyfriend. The same for me, it's like, you know, half of that, instead of eating the croissant that I make him, I'm doing a little side salad. So it's all about balance and portion control and not eating too late. And, you know, just if I have a big dinner the night before, say I do dabble and binge in those pieces of bread, I get up in the morning, get my cardio in him. And I love the steam and sauna. So we actually have a membership at the country club and we go there all the time. So I love to just sweat it out. I mm -hmm. love to sweat as much as I love to eat. So as long as I always <laughs> love it too, I think I'll be good. I hear you. I, I got it. I, I try I try to do the same. I'll, I will say it's been a real challenge uh, during quarantine because before quarantine, you know, I would go, you know, I'd go to the gym and, and work out four or five times a week. I'm a Pilates girl. So I love to do. You yeah, I, I, Pilates. Ever. Oh, you're kidding. I, so I know you do hot yoga. I saw yes, that on the, yeah. on the YouTube video. Yes, ma'am. OK, so I'm, I prefer Pilates to yoga because I'm I used to be a dancer. So and I grew up doing Pilates. So um, I, I, I really love it. But it's, it's been a bit of a challenge to just to, you know, do all the workouts at home or, you know, out in the park or wherever. But um, so here's what I want to know. What is next for you? I did RME pop for the longest. Um, so actually, that was the first thing that kind of got me on the radar. That was the first fan base I ever had. That was the first growth as far as you know having supporters and anything i started doing music so young but um all throughout middle school i had so many covers that i've now taken down because you know once you grow you don't like to see your old stuff anymore but <laughs> i did so many cover videos for the longest all throughout middle school and high school i would just cover a lot of um rele relevant songs in those periods mm -hmm. and then once i moved to la i started doing all original music and that was when like i said i got my first you know loyal fan base so if my real like OG fans have been riding with me since the very beginning and um I did so is that still a, is that still a big a big thing for you you know, pursuing your R&B music career Absolutely. I think, like I said, the, just the, it was quarantine, you know, quarantine put a, a big hold on a lot of stuff. Um, I wasn't able to get in the studio as much. I wasn't able to do shows right before quarantine in 2019, I did a high school tour. And so I traveled to, I want to say about 40 different high schools around LA. And um, I was with other artists. And in 2018 as well, I was with artists like Rodney Rich um, and did a whole high school tour with them. So it was really, really awesome doing that. But then of course, mm -hmm. when quarantine, hit it was kind of like a slowdown I was here in Houston a lot more I used to come back to Houston only like twice a year or really like three times a year for Christmas Thanksgiving and then one time randomly within like a March or April time of the year and mm -hmm. those were the only three times that I would come back to Houston so this is the most I've been in Houston ever like since I've moved to LA and so that's why you know that's when the author came into fruition and things like that but music was my first love your first, your first love okay so now so what's next then what 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 else is on your your list 
so many more entrepreneurships. I have another brand that I'm working on. I'm just so excited about it because I think once I really saw the feedback on my cookbook slash lookbook, I was just like, oh my gosh, I could, I could really like people rock with what I'm selling. It's, it's one thing when people, you know, know you for something as far as music and then, you know, adventuring out into something that's completely different that has nothing to do with music. It's a little scary feeling. It's like, okay, are people going to receive it? Well, are people going to accept it? How is it going to play out? And so to know that something so off the wall, like a cookbook and becoming an author did so well, I'm like, okay, hold on one sec. I need to come back with a, another brand, another um, adventure into the, my entrepreneurship. So I'm working on something right now. So within the next, hopefully. You can't share it yet. It sounds not like. Just, yes. See, so the thing with you can't me, break some news here on our Voices break some news. I will say it has to do with beauty. I will say that because um, okay. the crazy thing about me is just like, I think my biggest success is just moving in silent and working in silent. When I tell you I did this entire cookbook with not one post, with nobody knowing. And so when I announced it, people were just like, when did you do this? When did you even have the time? And the fact that it has over a hundred pictures, it's literally a picture book. Like you could literally, even if you don't cook, it's a coffee table book. That's what, you know, the best mm -hmm. thing with me for me and to make it still stay true to my brand was how can I make this cookbook still feel like Jilly that people, you know, will understand it. And that was when the lookbook aspect came into place. And for me, I just wanted it to be, you know, completely true to my brand, but it was so interesting because I was like, people were just, when did you take all these pictures? When, when did this happen? And I was just like, I mean, I just, I did it. I had two 12 hour days. So 24 hour a day in total of shooting just pure content for this cookbook and no one even knew about it. So I just love working in silence. I love when just the big announcement is just like, when did she even do this? Like when? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, clearly you are, you are just uh, such a go-getter and I can't wait to see you know, what, what the next thing is going to be in the beauty realm. And um, just to see how your music career and your acting career and um, your, your career as an author, how all of this sort of comes to fruition. And, and I know that you have so much to offer the world. What, what is the, the one thing, I guess, I always ask this of, of my guests that um, what is the one thing that you would like to leave with the audience to give us all a sense of optimism and hope for the future because you just exude positivity. I think the one thing that I want to leave is just not being afraid to do anything. You know, at the end of the day, we live in a world and a society where we're just afraid of the criticism. We're afraid of what people have to say. And my biggest thing is you have to be worried when they stop talking. When people stop saying something, when people stop talking about you, that's when you have things to worry about. So as long as they're talking, as long as they keep your name in your mouth, then as far as I'm concerned, you're doing something right. And that's what, that's how I look at it. That's what keeps me going. That's exactly how, you know, I keep pushing through. I'm not afraid to do anything. And don't get me wrong. It did take a minute to get to that point. You know, no one likes for negative things to be said. No one likes, you know, that harsh, just, just that negative connotation towards anything. But I had to learn, I was like, majority of the time, those are those fake pages. Majority of the time, that's just, you know, people hating and that what's the number one song? If you ain't got no haters, you ain't popping. And I think that's, that's something so great to live by because I think, you know, it sounds like funny, but it's so, so true. So I think the best thing that I can say is when people stop talking, that's when you really have to worry. So I'm gonna keep going, keep having people talking and I'm excited, I'm really excited. Well, I, I'm excited for um, just the, like I said, the, 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 the positivity and the energy that you bring to everything that you do. And um, obviously the sky's the limit. And um, so I just want to say thank you so much, Jilly, for sharing so much of yourself with our audience. And um, I think you're awesome. Thank you so much. I think you are so awesome. And thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. As I said, Jilly and young people of her generation give me so much hope for our future. I can't wait to see what she does next. In the meantime, if you're interested in following her on social media, we have links to all of that on the show notes, as well as a link to her cookbook. And I love the name of that cookbook, This Boss Babe Can Cookbook. 
And it's also a lookbook, as she was saying. So thank you very much for giving her permission to speak and for having the courage to listen to everything she had to share with us. I urge you to please go to your favorite platform and subscribe, like if you enjoy what we're doing. Would love to have you become an official part of the Our Voices Matter podcast community. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next time.